everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, it's wonderful for me to have the honor and the privilege to uh, welcome the great, incredible, prolific Nuruddin Farah. And I'm going to give a longish in introduction, just if some of you are not familiar with his extensive uh, <clears throat> you know, set of writings. So he's a novelist, essayist, and my favorite thing, he's a master of the trilogy. Uh, and is one of the most important contemporary authors working today. He very early on won the prestigious Neustadt Prize for Literature, and that's just one among several um, such accolades that he has collected. His writing career spans more than five decades, and he has published 13 novels, dozens of essays and plays, and all of these critically reflect on various dimensions of Somali history, culture, and politics. Um, Farah wrote his first novel, From a Crooked Rib, in 1970, and he hasn't looked back since. Um, he has penned three trilogies. The first one was called Variations on the Theme of African Dictatorship. Then came the Blood in the Sun trilogy, and then the Past Imperfect trilogy. And now we are eagerly awaiting the third book of his fourth trilogy, which hasn't been titled, I think. Um, and I think what's important to know here is that each trilogy engages completely new uh, literary styles. And to date, uh, he's one of the very few writers uh, with a truly incredible literary and formal agility and a capacity to keep innovating every time he writes uh, his books. Um, and I'm thrilled to welcome him here to Oslo, even though I'm not <laughs> from here. His uh, last novel, North of Dawn, uh, came out in 2018 and was set in Oslo and engaged with the tragedy uh, at Utoya. And I believe it's going to be translated in, into Norwegian within a year or so, so it's a perfect time to welcome him. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm going to start, um, you know, at the beginning. So you published your first novel, From a Crooked Rib, in 1970. That's over 50 years ago. You were only 25 years old. Um, so do you want to tell us a little bit about how you became a writer? I've heard that your mother was a poet and that you came from a sort of community that really, um, you know, cared about education. You were also a teacher. Uh, how did you how did you get into writing? Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be back in Oslo. How did I start writing? That's a very big question. <coughs> Well, there is, a, there is a proverb that says every journey begins with the first step. There were different stages of my life when I attempted to do some writing. And by writing, I do not mean sit down mm -hmm. and write something, but the mm -hmm. idea of putting things down on paper. One of the first things that I remember was that English being my fourth language, mm -hmm. one of the first things I remember was reading Crime and Punishment in Arabic. al Jarima wal and the thing that struck me at that time, I was reading about you know, 10, 11, I had an older brother who did not like that I was very, very restless. Either I had a ball which I was kicking around and <laughs> breaking glasses, or I was moving around. So to make me calm down, one of the things he did was he would give me big books, like Tolstoy's, <laughs> what is it called, War and Peace yeah. or Love and War. 
War and Peace or Dostoevsky's, you know, uh, Crime and Punishment. And the idea was, and the, there was an Arab uh, translation of some of the other books that I would also read. And an Egyptian novel is called Ihsan Abdul Quddus. The idea my brother had in his head was to give me the biggest book that he could find so that I would sit down and the condition was if I finished that book, came and told him the story of the book, he would give me a gift. That's the way I earned my pocket money. That's the way I earned gifts from him. It did give me the purpose of sitting down. It did give me the purpose of not being as restless because I knew that at the end of it, I would get something good. So that's one thing that happened to calm me down. The second thing that happened was in the 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 other thing that happened was the English language books that we used at school had stories. Mm -hmm. And the stories were, you know, let's say about one cat and nine rats. <laughs> what the one single cat would do would be that one cat would wait in a corner for one stray rat and would catch it and take it and eat it. So in the story, these nine cats or 11 cats, or whatever is left of the cat, of the, sorry, rats, got together to plot against the single, the one cat. And there is a dialogue between the rats. And the dialogue, some of them are wise you know, statements and some are foolish statements. So one of the things I did was I looked at my friends, the ones who were bullies and knocked me on the head every time I went past them. I gave them the bad lines. <laughs> and the good lines <laughs> went to my friends who were protective of me because I was the youngest in the class. So that's also another mm -hmm. way. In other words, I saw myself in a, in a way, I saw myself in literature. Yeah, in a place of power as well. Well, in a place of power and also in uh, punishing. Yeah, uh, punitive power. Yes, punitive <laughs> power. Punitive power. <laughs> Later then it became something that I began to fool around. And my first novella, a novella is between a short story and a novel, something in the region of 60, 70 pages, mm -hmm. I wrote when I was 18. Okay. From then on, and because I was, you know, this was translated into a number of languages. A short story of mine was translated into Greek, into Italian, into Arabic, into all these things when I was uh, not even at university. Mm -hmm. That gave me encouragement. Yeah. And that has continued. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is the beginning. Yeah. But there is one other thing that's also part of the beginning. Sure. And power is the beginning. When I was about 10, 11. By this time, my brother had managed to calm me down and nothing was forthcoming from him. No longer was he giving me as many gifts as he should. He was the oldest brother, so he didn't give me the... And I became again restless. So I started what I called a letter writing agency. Wow. <laughs> I'm 10, 11 years of age. I had a small table like this. And I wrote letters for people who 
were old enough, as old as my father. So they would tell me their stories, and I would write letters for them in English or in Arabic, mm -hmm. and began earning money. One day, a man came to me, and he said that he wanted me to write a letter to his wife. I worry. He was, he was very angry with her because she. Oh gosh. <laughs> because she went home. And did not come back. And he was very angry with her. So in the letter he said, "I want you to tell her to come back, and I'm giving her time." Mm -hmm in which to come back. I want her back in three months. If she does not come back in three months, and at that time we were living in Calafo, and had his wife had gone to Beletwain, which is in Somalia. If she does not come back in three months, I will go to Beletwain break every single bone of this woman. What? And <coughs> drag her all the way to Khalaf. <laughs> I was about 10. So instead of writing what he told me, <laughs> I wrote, if you do not come back in three months, you may consider yourself divorced. <laughs> When, when she received the letter, she took the letter to the judge of the town and explained that this is a letter written in Arabic, which is good, you know, because Arabic is considered to be mm -hmm. close to holy. And he says that if I do not come back in three months, I may consider myself divorced. And lo and behold, Six months later, she got divorced. She married another man. The man waited and waited. When she couldn't come back, he went back. He came to Ghalafo to find the man, the woman married. And he said, how come you are married? I'm, you're already my husband. Sorry, <laughs> I am your husband. What's wrong with you? So they, she showed him the letter that I wrote. <laughs> oh, gosh. He came back spoke to my father, who is a friend of his. And then my father forbade me to write letters anymore. <laughs> and I've run out of pocket money. Yeah. So in order to start to continue receiving pocket money, I thought I would continue writing. Yeah. That's one way of looking at it. Mm -hmm. OK. I mean, that's a great story. You were very uh, meddlesome. And, uh, you know, understood the power of writing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, I thought, I thought I had the power to misinform or mis <laughs> mis <laughs> to fabricate. miscalculate to, ri to write. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yes. No, yes. that's great. Um, and so then English was the viable language to write in. I know you always say it's your fourth language. So I know that Somali at the time was not transliterated but you didn't want to write in Arabic, even though you were reading all this. I did, I did write in Arabic. I did write in every language I learned. I did write Italian. in Italian and mm -hmm. Arabic and English. But because Somali had no orthography, no script, mm -hmm. until 1972, I had to wait to write in Somali right. in 1972 in October. It was, you know, uh, standardized. And then later, in five months, mm -hmm. I started writing a new novel in Somali okay. called Tolo Watele Ma. And then the novel used to be published once a week, a chapter would be published, oh. and continued writing until one day the censorship board in Mogadishu called me and asked me to explain one of the chapters of the book. Mm -hmm. And being a young, foolish man, I said, 
This is literature. You do not explain. Either you understand it or you don't understand it. <laughs> and so publication <laughs> was discontinued. Wow. And from there on, I stopped writing Somali. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, uh, I never c finished the novel that I started writing in Somali. Right. Yeah. Well, we Maybe should retrieve one day. it somehow. Maybe one day. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I know you studied in India, in Punjab, for a few years. And that might have also added to the English language sort of engagement, wanting to write more in English, because I assume you were studying in English at the university there. And sometimes I enjoy in your novels, you know, like it's understood in the English language writing. You often make references to Greek mythology, you know, he had the strength of Hercules or something like that, and it's taken for granted. But sometimes in your works, I find references to like a Hindu goddess or something. So, you know, which is kind of changes the lexicon a little bit. Um, and I, you know, just wonder about the influence of those years spent in India. Well, by the time I arrived in India, mm -hmm. I was 20, 21. And therefore, in one way, I was already formed. Mm -hmm. I knew what I wanted to do. And many people who knew me at that time, because the scholarship was given to me at the age of 19, mm -hmm. many people who knew me at that time did not think that it was wise of me to go to India. And nearly everyone, including my older brothers, thought that I would benefit from going to America mm -hmm. to study journalism and literature because I had a scholarship to go to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Oh my gosh. And, and then you so chose India? In place of going to America, I did not like going to America, and yeah. I'll explain to you a very silly couple of silly <laughs> incidents that, that happened in Somalia at that time. Some Somalis had gone to America and Italy and Germany because there was no university at the time in the country. And they came back. And like in the days of COVID, they used to carry uh, small little bottles full of alcohol. And therefore, every time they shook hands with people in Mogadishu, they would clean their hands and say, germs, germs because they came from Europe or America. Okay. And the idea of carrying a small bottle full of alcohol and cleaning my hands with alcohol every time I greeted a Somali okay. made me feel very silly. Yeah. And I thought, if I go to India, nearly everything is germ full. Absolutely. <laughs> Proudly, the Indians. And if I survive India, <laughs> if I survive <laughs> the germs in India. You'd have a great immune system. I would have a great <laughs> immune system, which I still do. Yeah, <laughs> touch wood. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we spoke about this before, but, you know, I know that, you know, the U.S. probably the top of the list for people thinking very racist towards Africans, black and brown people, but India, top of my list of mistreating <laughs> and being very anti-black. So I always wondered if you kind of had those terrible encounters because, you know, uh, it still goes on. It's still kind of, um, it's still so ingrained in the way in which within Indian culture. Well, it didn't affect me. Right. <coughs> it didn't affect me there was emotional standardization of racism, mm -hmm. if you want to call that. <coughs> Having been brought up a Somali, and as every child, Somali child who is sitting in this room would know, <laughs> Somalis are brought up to believe that they are the best looking people, the most intelligent. Factually true. <laughs> And so when I went to India and I discovered that people were being racist towards me, I said, don't they know where I come from? 
And this is one of the reasons why it didn't, it didn't affect me. And the reason is because every time they were racist, I would look at them and say, look, somebody needs to tell them. I am a Somali. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and already having exercised so much power in your hometown with the writing, you were all powerful. Well, but you know, <laughs> No, 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 but I understand honestly, what you mean. honestly, I do not, I do not easily, I don't succumb to racism. I can understand somebody disliking me for some <coughs> reason or another. But somebody playing racist games with me, mm. it doesn't make sense because I, I told you, you know, from the age, from a small age, I was told. You're the greatest. We'll cafe and meet you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Which means? There is no one better than you. Every mother, you know, Somali words of endearment, mm -hmm. Somali words of endearment are the most beautiful words of endearment. And yet Somalis also have a very, very sharp tongue. Mm. And so they could go either way from one second to the other. The mother who is saying to her child, my sweetest child, next time she could say, you are the stupidest idiot that God has created. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, w we survived all this. Yeah. And to survive that and then go to India and survive the germs. Yep. <laughs> Omniscience. All powerful. Uh, yeah, I know. And then I think there is a Somali nicknaming tradition that can get very... Vicious, like somebody gets a <laughs> nickname and it's very honest and very intense. And I think in some of your novels, you will sometimes name people a certain way, someone with one foot or like, you know, like just somewhat rude and <laughs> well, but interesting. Uh, yeah, but uh, you know, the same, <coughs> the same is true in India. Sure. Uh, you have Langare, which is obviously. <laughs> Langara. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is also in Somali, Langare. Yeah. It came from the north, and mm. we, we in the south have accepted okay. Yeah. Um, okay, I have another question. Well, I have many. But um, so you only write about Somalia and Somalis. At this point, you've probably lived outside of Somalia more than you've lived within Somalia. Have you been tempted to write about lots of other places and topics? I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, is Somalia your stubborn focus or a natural and organic flow in your work? Well, every time I have set a story somewhere else, mm -hmm. often I remind myself mm -hmm. the fact that although I have now lived in Cape Town for 25 years, I tell myself, Obviously, this is not quite true, but I tell myself everything that I know about South Africa could be put on the back of a postcard. In other words, very little. This is not the case, mm. but that's the way my starting point is. I need to know a lot more mm. than I already know before I write about it. That's one. The second thing that's also very, very important to remember is that people take ownership of the country from which they come. Sure. And therefore, even if you have not made a mistake by writing about somebody else, let's say you write a beautiful article, you misspell the name of someone. Mm -hmm. Misspell the name in such a way that it gives a different meaning to the name. Somalis who read the article would look at it and say, what does he know? <laughs> he doesn't even know the difference between bar and bar, <laughs> you see? Because one of them has double R, double A, mm -hmm. the other one has one A, and so on and so forth. So one has to be very cognizant of the fact that you can't get away with mistakes. You could have a beautiful book. You make one little mistake, the local person, the Norwegian, the Danish, the whoever you've written about, would say the most terrible things about that book mm -hmm. because they found one mistake. And if ordinary people find one mistake, you're in terrible situation. If scholars find one mistake in your book, they turn it into a PhD. 
So you have to continue thinking about 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 all this. Mm -hmm. The the other thing, obviously, is the ownership is quite important. Now, I am a Somali. It's possible that I may not have lived in Somalia mm -hmm. for close to 50 years. I continue writing about it. Why? Because I know that even if I make a mistake, my mistake would be an honest mistake. And even if I make a mistake, it would not, a Somali in his right or her right senses would not say this person doesn't know Somali. Mm -hmm. They could probably say this person doesn't have the anthropology of that particular thing. You know, in 2011, a kilo of sugar didn't cost $5. It costs two dollars. Somebody could argue about right. that. But when I write about sugar and the cost of sugar, I would not identify how much. Mm -hmm. I could say the sugar, sugar was cheap. Or sugar was expensive. That way you can avoid somebody attacking you anthropologically sure. and, and saying this. Mm -hmm. So one of the other reasons is Somalia is an open field. You know, there mm -hmm. aren't many writers. Right. Hiding in trees, <laughs> doing <laughs> all kinds of other things. And therefore, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Somalis also, because they, they like certain books and they hate certain books, <laughs> and they tell me why they hate certain books, Somalis don't like you to talk about sex. They do it all the time. <laughs> Just not in a book. But they don't like you to talk about it. Yeah. OK. <laughs> um, to develop this idea, right, writing about Somalia and Somalis, um, and you're often described as a writer in exile, and I think you were exiled. No, I'm not. In some way. Not anymore, but never. at some point. No, never. OK, good. Because uh, when I left Somalia, except for the years that I lived in Rome mm -hmm. and in England, I spent a great deal of my time in one African country or another, mm -hmm. which means that the houses in the townships in Cape Town, the townships in Nairobi, and the houses in Mogadishu, they're almost the same. Mm -hmm. People have the same pre-industrial level of education. And therefore, even though I was not physically living in Somalia, I was living in Africa where the same problems mm -hmm. occurred. Yeah. Sure. And that's why I always said, I am not in exile in the way uh, an African living in London, waking up every single day in London, mm -hmm. even in Tower Hamlets or whatever you want to call it. These people sometimes lose touch with the continent. Sure. I am in continuous touch with the continent and I have been in touch with the continent. That's one. The second thing is, to produce, in inverted commas, produce or write literature. There is certain knowledge that you do not need to have. Mm -hmm. You don't need to have a situation based on an everyday, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. What I'm saying is you need a generic understanding of the situation uh, the con the you need to know the contours of your narrative. Mm -hmm. And if you can follow that, yeah. because you're not writing specifically about a Somali when you're writing a novel, mm -hmm. even though the story may be about a Somali, you're writing about a universal subject because Somalis share the problems of difficulties with finance, children difficulties. You know, Somalis mm -hmm. who are 10 years old, I was pleasantly surprised 
that this evening I saw young Somalis who came with their mothers mm. to do that. Because you really, Somalis, when they reach the age of 10, 11, they don't want to have anything to do with their parents because they want to go and play. Soccer, <laughs> play, go around, and so on and so forth. So I think it's very important to know that writing sociology, Mm -hmm. Writing anthro about anthropology is different from writing literature. Sure. Let me push a little more on that. So what's very unique about your work and challenging for literary criticism and academics is that you produce your novels about the latest, most updated political events in Somalia, sometimes just a few years later. Um, and in fact, the past Imperfect Trilogy links and so on uh, we're talking about, you know, Black Hawk Down. And over the years, you've continually um, engaged with the event that just happened a few years before. So in a way, it's, it's unusual to kind of actively take on, use literature um, to take on the role of historian or like journalist, political scientist. Um, so I just, you know, and I think like a lot of writers many writers will actually defend themselves and say, no, I'm not a historian, I'm not a uh, political uh, thinker, I, I just produce art or so on. But you actively engage all these roles. And I just want you to say, say more, you know? How do you well, feel, uh, perceive yourself? Despite, despite, so you see, I am, uh, well, I'm a contradiction in, in a number of ways. But the other thing <laughs> is, To be able to have, to tell a story that stands on its own, mm -hmm. but makes references to different situations. To give you an example, my trilogy on African dictatorship mm -hmm has now produced no less than 20 PhDs from different aspects. Students of literature, students of political science, students of history. Absolutely. And the reason is, uh, and here uh, you will forgive me because I don't want to uh, you know, say very many pleasant things about my own books or praise them, but nearly everyone comes and hopefully takes a wealth of information that's there for them to use it in whatever capacity or yeah. you know whatever mm -hmm. they, they 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 like uh, and because i do not separate those th categories categories yes, yes. I do not say this is sociology, this is anthropology, and so on and so forth. But I'm continuously aware of where these things sit. And the question that I have never been able to answer, despite reaching uh, uh, my age, is when does a text once written, when does it become literature? Mm -hmm. I haven't quite worked the, that one out. In mm -hmm. other words, when I publish a book, it's usually put in the literature section. Yeah. I do not know if that is correct, except I know that a book of mine called Maps used to be put in the Maps section. <laughs> yeah. So v very few actual maps in the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see. No. Yeah, I understand. And I then, and then the other thing that was quite interesting. Uh, when I published Sweet and Sour Milk, my favorite, uh, Somalis would take the names of the characters and they put them in one column. And then against them, they would write the people who I, whom I am supposed to have based my story on. Even though I'd never seen these people, I don't know who they were. Mm -hmm. Because these people met a certain char characteristics 
mm. they fit that particular yeah. idea of, of Somali. Yeah. Uh, and even my first novel, From a Crooked Rip, I happened to be once in a small town in Somalia called Belaguen, visiting uh, an uncle of mine. And then sitting in a bar in Belaguen, a woman comes and says, the story oh. of the novel is her story. Wow. And therefore, I should share the royalty with her. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and did you? <laughs> yeah. There, is a, there wasn't enough for me, so there was nothing yeah. <laughs> for, me, for me to do. I like the audacity of this woman. Sure. It's great. Sure. Um, you know, now, after almost 40 years or so of... Uh, producing works based in Somalia? 50 years. No. And more. Around, at the 40-year point, your books left Somalia, not Somalis, there were still Somalis in them, but they left Somalia, and Hiding in Plain Sight was published, and it was set in uh, Kenya, and then North of Dawn, set right here in Oslo. Um, and like, in a symbolic sense, are you sort of admitting that Somalia as a nation is not, as a place is no more kind of functional for you that Somalia is now shaped by the vast diaspora scattered across the planet. I mean, so many places. No. Has something shifted in your thinking? No, not at all, not at all. Somalia came to a different stage in its history, to a different stage in its history. And then it stayed in that stasis, mm -hmm. moving neither forward nor backward. Because the Civil War turned it into a non-functioning, uh, well, uh, yeah, sure. a, a failed state. Yeah. Uh, I could continue going back to it and doing research but I doubt very much if there was any change. Mm -hmm. Because the stories, you need an engine to move the story. And if you could not find something new to say about the place, mm. I felt there was nothing. Sure. You know, that's one. The second thing that's also very important is that the Somalis who live abroad yeah. are Somalis. Mm -hmm. Even these who live in Norway and who are Norwegian citizens, quite often when they wake up in the morning and look at their faces in the mirror, they're Norwegians. They're Somali, sorry, not Norwegian. Yeah, bo both they become Norwegians later on when they are interacting with Norwegians. Yeah. You see? Because Somali is a Somali first. And it's because of that mm. that Indian racism did not affect me. Sure. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, but you had you realized that it was time to kind of address those. Well, and then I'm going back because if Somalia changes and Shabab is beaten and thinks the story moves on, mm -hmm. I will be able to go back to Somalia. But yeah. but what I'm saying is the Somalis, it's it's that story. Yeah. That 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 moves me. Sure. Uh, and because Somalis here also have the right mm -hmm. to be written about. Yeah. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why I wrote the novel about, uh, you know, set in Oslo. In Oslo. There are similarities, although Norwegians may not agree with me. There are similarities in a lot of ways between Somalis and Norwegians when it comes to migration. About three, four hundred years ago, yeah. this country was very poor, and especially in the mountainous regions. Mm -hmm. It was also a colony, Danish colony. It's also, you know, if you're in the rest of the Scandinavia, terrible things are said about the Norwegians. And my heart goes out to the Norwegians more often than I admit. But 
the important thing is, in terms of migration, the Norwegians, it's as if they have never learned about their own history enough to know to welcome other people. Other people who sit in the empty chairs, because there are empty chairs. Why? Because many of the Swedes, many, sorry, of the Norwegians have left the country from Trondheim, from other places in the mountainous regions where they were poor. And these people, a number of them were fishermen. When they ended up in North Dakota, they became farmers. Mm. When Somalis arrived here, they didn't have a job that gave them the possibility of working in, 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 in Norway. So these are some of the things that the novel touches on migration and immigration. Mm -hmm. And as, what's his name, uh, Entensberger's book, Europe and U Europe, Europe. I don't know if you know, if you know the book. Uh, whenever there is an empty space, if you come into a train, into a, you know, one car on the train, and you find every seat taken except the one empty seat, you think you are entitled to that one empty seat. But, okay. So you say, is this empty seat taken? You speak to the people in the car mm -hmm. who got there before you. Let me begin the story from okay. the beginning. Let's imagine a train is leaving Oslo and it's on its way to where? Trondheim. <laughs> <laughs> One person goes in, he's a scholar, he has his books, he puts them down, spreads, marking papers, students' papers, so some of the papers are there, and then he takes one of the papers, corrects, and then he puts them on the other side. He continues. A second passenger comes. There is space. He sits opposite because there are empty seats. Sure. By the time the third one comes, the two people who got there first claim ownership of the car, the spaces in the car. Mm -hmm. Because you have to ask these people, is this seat empty? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So the Somalis did not come and say, are these seats empty? They came because they were refugees. In the same way as the Norwegians who went to North America did not ask for permission. They were encouraged to go to America. Ask yourself the question, what kind of land did the Norwegians who finally ended up in America or Canada, what kind of land did they get? The Americans would kill, massacre millions of North American Indians. Their land, mm -hmm. which now belonged to the state, the murderous state that killed all these people, that land would be given to the Norwegians. And they would pay 75 cents an acre for land that belonged to the North American Indians who were massacred. So what I'm saying is there are stories that are worth reading about and understanding about migration uh, you know, and probably it's not my place, but I think uh, the school curriculum must spend some time on explaining the history of, Norwe of, of Norwegian migration to the younger generation so that they know why they are mm. who they are today. Yeah. I don't know if I'm making sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, I promised you some critical questions. So you're right at the point where you're really talking about the history of colonialism, erasure of indigenous people and accommodating uh, European settlers and things like that. And you are a writer that came up during the same time as, you know, all the greats that are just as reputed and prolific as you, Gugi Wationgo, Chinua Achebe, uh, Ama Ata Aidu, all your age, you know. Um, and all of them are sort of staunch anti-colonialists and they have spent, you know, a lot of energy and engagement thinking about the pernicious effects of colonialism on the countries they come from, including dictatorships, coups, uh, all kinds of failed state type of things, if you want to call it. But sometimes when I read your works, I don't necessarily feel you take a very, you're very invested in a kind of anti-colonial mode. Sometimes you may even appear nostalgic for some past time, you know. Really? Yes, like the Italian, you know, there's some Western, some sort of, um, I don't know, some sort of kind of... Um, Give me an example. Give me an example. Fondness of Italian... Um, be, be the scholar that you are <laughs> and give me uh, uh, yeah. uh, one paragraph, one book in which mm -hmm. I am nostalgic about Not colonialism. I think nostalgic is the wrong word. I think like fondness of a certain type of... So, you know, it's also connected to, say, the shift over time with the way you've portrayed women. I think, you know, one of the things that's very attractive about your works and some of your older works is extraordinary women, independent, spirited, uh, wonderful, we could say feminist. And then in the last few years, something has shifted. You know, you seem annoyed about the religious tendencies. There is a, the representation has shifted. You know, Give me an example again, a character or something. The character You're the scholar, of <laughs> let's hear. <laughs> the character in North of Dawn of the, uh, the mother, and she's so, she's so shrill, you know, she's so um, nasty. I'm forgetting her name. There's the characters, the women that show up, and you, you refer to the burqas as, as tents, you know. Um, and I feel maybe it's a bit unfair because I think the shifts that have happened over time in Somalia well, you know, uh, are unfortunate, but it's not necessarily like the women's fault or something. You know what I mean? Well, I am totally and absolutely against the idea <coughs> of certain changes of culture. Mm -hmm. In the sense that I'm against the idea of treating an entire community as one unit. Sure. And if we were to take, for example, my idea about what I call the tent. Yeah. <laughs> it's because Somali culture had Somali women had those beautiful clothes that they wore on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. They walked elegantly, mm -hmm. but what happened a bit later mm -hmm. is that the tent covers the whole cloth and therefore you could not see you could not see the person as yeah. such. You could not see the person as such. Mm -hmm. That's one. The second thing is, there is no tolerance on the part of Wilia, mm -hmm. the woman yeah. character. She beats her child, yeah. tortures him. He lives in Norway tortures him if he brings another Norwegian child to be with him. Mm -hmm. 
she comes from somewhere else, refuses to accept mm -hmm. to live in a place that belongs to someone else and refuses to integrate, refuses to learn Norwegian, refuses to learn everything. Now, these are some of the things that I'm, as a person, not yeah. as a writer even, I am against the idea of someone who shuts himself and goes somewhere else and therefore says, mm -hmm. you know, I am going to remain the way they are. There has to be change yeah. in people's attitudes. Now, I was once asked in an interview, what were the things that Somalis have lost in the Civil War? And one of the things I said was Somalis no longer dress the way they used to dress. A Somali woman who is married could be told separated from a Somali woman who is not married. Because Somali women plaited their hair, which is anchoring. Now, everything must be covered in a tent. Obviously, that I am against. Yeah. I understand. So for cultural survival, for the sake of cultural survival, I say, can't we be Muslim, remain Somalis? We don't have to change within a short period of time. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. And that's all I'm saying. I'm saying I'm, I'm very happy to be Somali, to be Muslim. I am proud of it, but I do not want to become an Afghani in the, the way that I, I put on clothes. That's, what I, that's all I'm saying. So have I, become, have I become cruel? Have I changed simply because I say the clothes that these people wear does not agree with the aesthetics of the Somali? Because every country, every culture has its own aesthetics. <laughs> the difference between the Somali uh, Guntino, which many people, many young women do not wear, and the sari is the Indian sari, the woman uncovers the middle, mm -hmm. the riff, the middle riff, midriff. The Somali woman, it's on the side. It's open on this side. And they moved quite freely, talked quite freely, noise, everything. Now they don't because they're all, yeah. that I'm not happy about. Yeah, yeah. All I'm saying is that there is. There and and <laughs> I, I want to, if I come into a room, I'm not married now. So if I came into a room, <laughs> so if I came in, into a room and I cannot tell the woman who is married, the woman who is not married, <laughs> I get confused. Makes it hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so you can't accuse me of being unfair to women. <laughs> yeah. I think the clothes are the clothes, and then there is complex, interesting, you know, reasons why those clothes come on, and there is a personhood inside, I guess. And well, I, I don't see the person who is inside. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. That's my problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, we can. Yeah, we can take uh, questions. We are almost yes. into an hour, yes, so yeah. uh, I'm sure you're going to have flooded with questions. So 